Hello everyone, in this video I would like to talk about three of the biggest lessons about dating that I have learned, both based on my personal experience and also based on observing so many other men and women and their dating successes and challenges. So, the first lesson is this, everyone is different and every stereotype has exceptions. Now, I know it sounds obvious, but so many of us tend to forget it in so many specific situations when it comes to dating. Let me just give you a few specific examples that you have to keep in mind when you go out there and you meet people and you make connections. Different people respond to the same comment, to the same approach, to the same pickup line, to the same icebreaker or to the same joke differently. What entertains and makes one person laugh can be very offensive to another person. Moreover, the same person, you, may react differently to the same comment or to the same joke, depending on what kind of mood you're in at that moment, what kind of day you've had, who irritated you or made you happy uh, before you heard that comment. So, there can be no single recipe for a perfect pickup line or for a perfect way to entertain someone or per for a perfect way to create an interesting conversation or for a perfect way to apologize. Different things work on different people. That's why any advice, any article you read, any video you read about the perfect text message to send, the perfect way to start a conversation with someone, the perfect way to do anything, there's no such thing. It really depends. It depends on who you are, it depends on another person, and it depends on the dynamic between the two of you. Another example, uh, when is it the right time to physically escalate with a woman and make a move? Well, obviously it depends on the level of attraction between you. It's not all binary, yes or no. It's are you really, 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 really attracted to each other? Are you kind of attracted to each other? Can you barely keep your hands off of each other? Does she feel the same way as you do? What is her background? What is her cultural, what, what is her cultural background? What is her religion? What, is, what are her goals? What are your goals? In almost every situation, the answer is it depends. You cannot follow some kind of a strict guide. You have to use common sense and you have to look at the situation, first of all, in light of its own individual circumstances. And you have to ask yourself the most simple question, what, whatever it is that I want to do, does it make sense in this situation with this person? So, the second lesson is you don't have to be very similar to get along and have a great connection with someone. And um, this is what I mean. Many people out there may have similar hobbies and similar interests and they may be living in a similar uh, area, maybe in the same neighborhood, and they have a similar family composition, and yet they have little chemistry, they have little to talk about, and they really, they're, they're not feeling it. It happens. And yet so often you have two people who come from different parts of the world, different religions, different races, different backgrounds, and they have an amazing time together. Because they just connect in a way through humor, through sarcasm, through certain observations about life, about politics, about religion, about different societal issues. And it doesn't matter that they are used to eating maybe different foods or that they look very differently or they dress very differently. It helps sometimes having certain things in common, but that often doesn't say everything or at least doesn't say much about your um, prospects of connecting with someone. Why do I say that? Because so many people out there say, I'm looking for someone who has as much in common with me as possible. Do you really have to like the same music and the same movies and the same theater and the same rock climbing and the same hiking? Is it not enough if you really, really like each other, but you only do two or three out of those things together and then you have two, three, four hobbies of your own? Do you really need, as a guy, for example, do you really need your significant other to like rock climbing with you in order for you to be attracted to her or love her? Or can you do other things together and uh, this rock climbing business you can do with your friends and this could be your separate quality time from her. The same about a girl. If you like knitting, do you really want the guy to like knitting as well? Or is it enough for you that he respects 
your hobbies. He lets you do them. He doesn't restrict you in any way. And he's okay with you spending your quality time meeting alone or with your friends. And the third lesson that I would like to talk about um, is um, the downside of texting. And this is the lesson that we're presented with over and over and over all around us. So many connections, so many communications from the very first message that you send someone on a dating app to texting with someone maybe after you went out on a date or two. So many problems, frictions, arguments, fights and early breakups occur simply because people do not have a live conversation. They send to each other texts, a mild misunderstanding snowballs into something bigger. Before you know it, you have a fight over nothing. It happens all the time. I'm sure if people stopped texting, I know it's a lot to ask, but if people stopped texting and they just committed to talking on the phone more, just imagine you have a dating app that doesn't allow you to text. You have to call the other person. I am sure that this will eliminate like 90% of the pointless frictions and fights and, and, and uh, random unmatches. Doesn't mean you're going to like everyone, but at least you, have, you will have better reasons for not getting along or unmatching each other and not talking again. Maybe you don't have a good conversation. Maybe you're not attracted to each other physically if you're video chatting and not because someone said something and you thought they meant something else when they didn't and they tried to clarify and then you said, you know what, I'm done. Next. So these are the three lessons, three big lessons that I think I learned and uh, I encourage you to keep them in mind in order to help you in uh, your dating journey. Thank you. Even though generally you're not liable for any type of injury or damage caused by your contractor, by the company that you hire to perform certain work, when that injury or damage is caused by them to their workers or to some third party, there are two important exceptions to this non-liability rule that you should be aware of in order to avoid any risk of still incurring such liability. The first exception is called the retained control exception. And this basically means that when you become involved in your contractor's work in a way that contributes to the occurrence of an injury, you along with a contractor may be found liable for that injury. Here's an example. Let's say you hired a company to perform a certain construction work on your property. And, um, they have a bunch of employees and they're supposed to be doing all the work and yet you go to the job site and you, um, let's say, the, the contractor says that we don't think that these scaffoldings are appropriate and we would like to put different, more expensive scaffoldings. And you're saying, no, 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 I'm not going to pay for it. I insist that your workers use these scaffoldings. And then, let's say, as a result of this, uh, one or more of the workers uh, get injured. Maybe they slip off or fall off those scaffoldings because they turn out indeed to be defective or not to be appropriate for that work site. So in this case where you retain some control over the work, where you direct it, where you told the contractor how they should be performing their work, in that case you um, might be liable for that injury along with the contractor. And um, the second exception to be aware of is a known hazard exception, a known hazard exception. So let's take the same example. You have a construction site, the contractor is there with their workers and they ask you for uh, a ladder and uh, they need a ladder to get up somewhere to fix an electrical pole or whatever. And you bring them a ladder that you for instance, no is defective, that it's not working properly, maybe it's broken, and there's evidence that you know that it was broken because you tried to use it before, someone else tried to use it, they already told you that the ladder needs to be thrown away or fixed, but you still give it to the workers, one of the workers falls, so that's a known hazard exception. In that case, again, you along with the contractor might be liable for that type of injury. So, keep these two ex two exceptions from non-liability 
uh, in mind when you hire contractors. If you want to completely minimize any type of liability for any such injury by, uh, sustained by a worker, do not get involved in the, in the work unless absolutely necessary. Do not, do not get involved in the work of that contractor of that company. Let them do their job and then if you do get involved, make sure that whatever you give them, whatever you do, whatever condition you create for them um, is safe or at least it's not known already to be dangerous or defective. Thank you.